Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today I have a very special guest on. He doesn't work in porn, but we sort of met through porn, so I figured it would be appropriate for me to have him on. Uh, Brian Redband. Hey. Hey. So, Brian. How do you know I don't work in porn? I don't. Actually, maybe you do. Maybe you have like a secret clips for sale store that I don't know about. You're right. (laughs) You know me. I actually actually used to cam. uh, I didn't do porn on it, but I did cam on uh, Chatterate. Yeah, Chatterbait. Wait, what do you mean you didn't cam, but you didn't do porn? Well, what did you do? I, I had this idea because I kept on getting in trouble for like content and stuff like on Ustream and YouTube and all mm-hmm. that. So I decided, you know what? I bet I won't be banned on Chatterbait. So I <laughs> sent my license and all my stuff in there. And then uh, I, I just played with it for a while where – and it was cool because I was making money because people were like, what is Brian doing on Chatterbait? <laughs> so I just like put lotion on my cheek for like – Ten dollars, and I would comb, I'd comb my hair slow if for like five bucks. Wait, and, people paid for that? Oh, I made in like two hours. I made one hundred and forty bucks, and I was like, I should just do this for a living. Why'd you stop? Uh, I didn't really stop, but one thing that was annoying, I couldn't have guests on without sending them their information. You know, oh, so then I was like, ah, oh, now I have to register everybody. So yeah, and that, it kind dude, of, that sounds like a fucking. Hold on, I should do that because like all the people that I have on are people who are like on Chatterbait anyways. Absolutely, and they probably already registered. You could have that as like a little side thing, yeah. so they could sit there and masturbate while you talk to them or oh something. Oh my god! Well, I mean, everybody <laughs> masturbates while they talk to me. I'm doing it right it now. <laughs> it's a good thing that this table is so high. <laughs> Okay, that's good. What else should I do about my podcast, Brian? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, right out of the gate, you like came up with a great fucking tip for me. Yeah, it's fun. You actually started off. Um, how did you get into the podcasting world? Because you're like, you've been doing this for a while, right? Yeah, I think we're going on. Shoot, I don't even know. Maybe nine years or something. Eight years. Uh, well, it started off doing it for Joe Rogan. We, right. uh Helped him create his podcast, and we did that. Which f- no one's ever heard of. Yeah, it's up and coming. <laughs> it's, uh, you know. You guys haven't heard of it. You should check it out. Right. He needs the <laughs> He definitely needs help. I mean, I, he might get Kanye West tomorrow, but, you know, who knows? Probably but, <laughs> not. <laughs> right. Uh, but, no, I started doing that for a while, and then that became successful. And uh, then I was like, one day I was like, to Joe, I was like, you know what? I, I should start, like, a podcast network. I had this whole idea for a podcast network. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't really a thing, if a thing, at the yeah. time. And the whole idea was, like, going to be, like, a radio station for podcasters. Right. And so I did that, and I brought all my friends, this other up-and-coming guy named Tom Segura and, like, Sam Tripoli and Ari Shafir. And I just did a podcast for all of them. And then then I got into just being the guy to go to for podcasts. And it, I was doing, it at one point, maybe 11 podcasts a week. Uh, and I was editing them all. They're all video podcasts. And this was, like, you know, long time ago, the video, right. you know, so... And I, I burnt myself out pretty good, uh, and then now I just kind of focus on a couple podcasts now. I don't really yeah. go deep into the thing anymore. Yeah. Uh, kind of over it. Yeah, dude, I can imagine. <laughs> I've only done, this is like podcast, what, like 75 or something like that? But I already feel like, fuck, dude, people do like thousands of these, and like, how do you not get so sick of, yeah, so sick of it? Yeah. It's, you'd be kind of, I don't know, for me, I, I kind of checked out a lot because mm-hmm. it was like I was doing so many that they all kind of combined into one podcast. But one good thing about it is I had never talked that much in my life. Mm-hmm. And so for comedy, as being a comedian, it was like, oh, well, this actually helped me uh, with comedy because right. uh, that's, you know, one of the main parts of comedy is talking. So, <laughs> <Is it>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, unless I had a puppet or a, you know, a prop. But, uh, or yeah. you actually did masturbate. <laughs> Yeah, that that's right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, because I've been doing this like only about a year and a half, and um, I'm definitely still like I'm so. Cr- I, I listen. Do you find that you're a better speaker and a better listener for it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's helped me a lot, and I'm definitely still trying to work on. Dropping the likes and the uh, like. Would you listen to uh, your episodes and then well, kind so that, of critique the n- way that you spoke? No, or? because that would drive me insane. Yeah, and there's a lot of things like the likes and the uhs and uh-huh. the, um. She, I just did right there. <laughs> but no, no, no. I I don't like listening to myself at all. And especially since when I was deep in the, the podcast, a lot of I had a studio which had a bar and a lot of it, it combined drinking and yeah. podcast. Yeah. And man, listening to yourself drunk is one of the worst things ever. <laughs> 
I mean, I delete half my Instagram stories the next day because of that, you know? So. <laughs> I totally, totally fucking relate. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Did you so? Did you start off podcasting and then you got into comedy, or did they like kind of start at the same time? No, I, I've been doing comedy since I even moved here. I, was, I did comedy in Ohio, and uh, is that where you're from? Yeah, okay. and then uh, when I moved out here, I wasn't doing it too much. Uh, I actually had quit for a couple years, and then Rogan threw me back on stage. And, and, and like I was like a new comic in Ohio, like mm-hmm. you know, open micer. And then when Joe started throwing me on stage, he's like, "Hey, you're gonna." You're going to open up for me in front of, you know, 3,000 people, so get on stage right now. And I was like, what? You know, so I kind of got thrown into the deep end to you uh, have comment. Mater- you had material written in it? I mean, I had, like, I guess material written, <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe, like, 15 minutes max. And then I was probably doing 10 minutes. And, now, I mean, I had to write a lot, though, because yeah. it was it was fast pace because i mean joe had sold out shows every weekend right. so like every week i had to at least write something new and right so it was you know it it was fun and i definitely i love it because i definitely skipped a lot of parts of comedy where you know i went right from you know zero to a hundred right. uh, so it was a little easier for me but it must have also been super stressful it was stressful but i drank a lot so <laughs> <laughs> and luckily once the podcast came out uh, we started doing it with joe uh people started knowing who i was right. so it made it a lot easier and that's one thing like if your audience knows who you are it makes it a thousand times easier when you're doing jokes because they know you yeah uh, whereas if uh, they didn't know me and then they're just like judging like who is this guy what's he talking about yeah. get out of here you yeah know, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, um, comedy to me, like stand-up comedy to me, is like one of the most terrifying things that you could ever do. I had this experience, it's so stupid, I had this experience in like summer camp when I was a kid where I tried to do stand-up comedy and I think I tried to steal, I stole some material from like Julie Brown or something like that. Do you remember who that is? Oh, I don't know what it is. Like she was like this redhead and she had this show on MTV. You know what I'm talking about, oh, right? downtown Julie Brown. It wasn't downtown Julie Brown someone different? She's the British chick. We should look this up. Can you look it up? Sure. What is it? Okay, so there was, I swear there was two Julie Browns on MTV. Julie Brown. There was like a redhead who was like a comedian, and then there was like downtown Julie Brown who was like, had an English accent oh, yeah, and was more of a okay. presenter. All right, so that wasn't the redhead. I know who you're talking Do you know who I'm talking yeah, about? She- right? What? Was it Julie? Maybe it was maybe someone's. It was totally, that would be weird totally if they had two different. Julie Browns on MTV. I know. Though. I could. I mean, my memory is terrible, so I could be completely fucking wrong. But anyways, so I I stole this material from her because that's how all comics start, right? Yeah. And I remember I did it in front of my stupid summer camp class, and nobody laughed. Like it wasn't even remotely funny, and I thought it was hilarious. And I was rushed afterwards and I still like remember that as you know you those really humiliating moments when you're a child that just stick with you forever Mm -hmm. that was definitely one of them yeah what one of the things you learn quickly in comedy is not necessarily the jokes it's the how you deliver them and so like even if it's a funny joke if you're up there going you know like people notice that body language and they're kind of thrown out of the whole experience right right um, what do you, I heard that Tiffany Haddish had a really bad New Year's Eve set. Yeah. Did you see any of it? No, I mean, I saw what was posted and stuff, which, you know, I used to go on the road with her all the time and, mm-hmm. you know, before she blew up and now, uh, you know, she's a superstar, but I mean, every comic has a, a bad set or two once a week sometimes, depending, yeah. you know, uh, but the problem is that a couple of things, one, it's New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve sets. Like a lot of comics I know don't even do those anymore right. or do them at all uh, because everyone's there to have fun and get drunk and they're already drunk and then you, everyone's in a party and you're not. So half the time the audience is just the worst audience ever because they're drunk and like they're not even paying attention. They're there for mm-hmm. just a party. Right. Uh, which is the worst, you know, uh, for comedy because you want people to sit there and listen, you know, yeah. to your jokes and and on top of that, uh, she just, you know, she's released, since she she got big, she's released, released maybe two specials, maybe even more. And that means she took all her material and put it on, online, then had to start over, make a new hour of material, mm-hmm. and then start over. Because when you release a special, you don't do your jokes anymore. You know, because like, right. people are like, we just saw that on HBO. Why am I here watching the same thing? So you, right. So she probably has burnt all her material out, not been on stage much from filming so many movies, and just because re- I mean I had seen her a couple t- nights ago, and I could tell she, you know halfway through she was doing that Q and A thing, 
uh, what she did at the New Year's Eve, Eve thing where she just started asking the audience, like, hey, what's going on? And usually that means uh, you don't have any material anymore. <laughs> right, right, right. So, I mean, it's just, you know, a perfect storm. She's partying, too. She's in Miami or wherever she was. I'm sure she was just... Well, she Going posted crazy. something on Instagram before, like right. saying basically she'd been up all night drinking and she was still kind yeah. of drunk and she had a, a thing that night. Yeah, like me and me and uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, this other comic that we used to go on the road with, we always talk about this one night partying. She used to party hard and mm-hmm. I used to party hard and so did Tony. But like I've never partied harder than I did with her one night and like to the point where we're all – had to go to the store and buy Pedialytes, and we're all just chugging Pedialytes all day. She puked uh, out the window the next day, <laughs> driving to the next city. Uh, I've totally done like, that. <laughs> yeah, like, it was, I mean, she, so I can see it. I mean, uh, not to mention that, you know, like, being such a big superstar type thing and and not doing comedy, you know, as much, because she, she's been doing comedy her whole life, since she was, like, 13 or something like, like that. stand-up comedy? Stand-up comedy. Okay. Like, she actually was... Uh, when she was, I think, 13 or 14, something crazy like that, uh, she started off at the Laugh Factory, had this, like, like comedy camp, and it was for kids who wanted to get into comedy. Mm. And she used to do that, and, like, Dane Cook used to be one of her mentors and teachers and stuff like that. And so she's been doing it her whole life. That's why I think, because, I mean, she's always been one of the funniest stand-ups ever, but, you know, if you're not doing the same material you've been doing your whole life and mm-hmm. you're doing all new material or you don't even have material and she's not practicing new material, I can see where that's just, you know, the worst combination. Not to mention, everyone's forgetting that most important part of that whole entire, entire article, Florida. And Florida is known by many comics as being the worst place to do stand-up comedy. Really? Just because the audiences. Oh wow! Yeah, they're not there. What? What did you get? You know, <laughs> you could just imagine. Just watch live PD for ten minutes. You'll see Florida. You know. <laughs> um. Yeah. So it's interesting. So you think that she kind of like first of all didn't have time to write new material, which you have to do all the time, right? Or and then, practice it. And then I was going to say and practice it like online, or online, on stage with people, practice your jokes on people and then like kind of fine tune it. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, Kate Quigley is a friend of mine. And so we've talked a little bit about comedy because the whole thing is so like foreign to me. Um, and she talks about like how you j- like people will drop into the Laugh Factory or the comedy store or whatever. And you don't get really paid much to do your sets from yeah, what I get understand. Paid at all. Yeah, but people do it. Really big comics do it because they need that constant oh, yeah. on stage practice and they mm-hmm. need to try jokes on an audience and then no this works this doesn't work Mm -hmm. that kind of thing yeah absolutely that's part of it so do um how often do you do comedy uh what depends you know a lot of times i used to do it as much as possible here in los angeles but i have this whole thing where i hate doing comedy in la it's the worst place to do comedy in my opinion florida no, not worse than oh, okay. play, but <laughs> but it's pretty bad. Uh, I probably do it in town two or three times a week, but you know it depends. Week after week, it's different. Uh, like I have a set tonight, and I, you know it's it's one of those things. I prefer being on the road. I prefer being outside of Los Angeles, and then you know I'll I'll do like a weekend somewhere, or you know like a couple nights somewhere, mm-hmm. and then that's way better than... What's, why is the L.A. crowd so bad? Well, one, it, it's it's usually tourist, mm-hmm. and so it's usually like you have a room that's maybe 10% know who you are, mm-hmm. and 80% has never even been to a comedy show before, and the other 10% is blacked out. But what it's, it's, you know, it's not the perfect storm. You, the best audience for a comedian is a comedian that's there to see you Mm -hmm. and and that really doesn't happen that much in los angeles you know it's it's usually the people that like you and see you in los angeles uh it's probably you know they'll come to shows but it's not the whole audience if you go somewhere like say like i go to texas tomorrow Mm -hmm. i have a show that whole audience is there to see you for Mm -hmm. the most part and in most clubs so that makes it a lot better show everyone's there because they have you and stuff and And they like your sense of humor right your type of humor because people have different types oh yeah i'm I'm one of the dirtiest comics in the world so like i'll go to some of these shows and it's like you you walk out and you're like okay now uh everyone in this audience is 70 years old uh and (laughs) i'm about to do a bunch of dick jokes in front of these guys so you know (laughs) sounds like my kind of comic (laughs) yeah I never, you know, I never go to, com- I don't go to comedy shows as much as I should. I feel like I should go more, but I have Absolutely. to say that like what, what freak, I get so nervous for the people on stage because 
like when I went to go see Kate, there was, um, I guess at the beginning you have like new comics that are like trying to kind of like the one that I went to, um, she, is there something about like it, you can get like, um, a spot in a comedy show if you bring a certain amount of people to to the show those right are, is those, that are, a thing? those are called bringer shows those okay. are those are shows that usually re- normal real comics never do it's the worst and a lot of, and I'm really happy that comedy's like such in a boom right now that's mm-hmm. doing so good right now that a lot of those shows are starting to not exist anymore like where a lot of clubs when people weren't coming to comedy clubs as much uh, you'd see those shows all the time, like maybe mm-hmm. one out of three shows were those. But now it's those are kind of getting rare, I guess. Yeah. So that's a good thing. What do you think is like responsible for the comedy boom? Do you think it has anything to do with podcasts? Podcasts. I was going to say podcasts. Specials. D- definitely. There's been a ton well, of specials. Well, it, it's because specials because of podcasts, I think. Right. You know, it really, I mean, not to toot Joe's horn, but, you know, the Rogan podcast and like all the stuff I've done for podcasting and and introducing all these comics, I think, has really helped. I mean, the comedy clubs and and everything. Because I mean, uh, podcasting. You're, what's cool about podcasting is you start listening to a podcast, say like Tom Segura and Christina Pajitsky. You'll start listening to them every week. You start, you know, to the point where you know these people inside and out, and and you're a diehard fan now. Yeah. Where that, you know, in the past it was like, oh, I saw them on Johnny Carson, and uh, you know that six minute interview that was really cool. But you know, I don't know if I, you know, yeah. that, you're going from six minute interviews on late night shows to two hours a week, three hours a week. Right. So I think you know that's a huge part of it. But you know, there's been comedy booms before. It's it's always gone up and then got and crashed pretty hard right, so right. it's interesting to see if that happens what do you think again. about um louis ck starting to perform again that was one of the questions that one of the fans sent me that's a tough one uh i've always loved louis uh too. and i think I though really sad yeah the whole thing I, I don't even think it's a big thing as much <laughs> that, either you know yeah, i know because people have asked me because they're like oh you're a woman what do you think and here's the hard thing like i'm not the right person to ask about right. that i pay guys to masturbate in front of me <laughs> yeah literally exactly, exactly. <laughs> so like to me like i'm so jaded right. that i was just kind of like yes obviously that wasn't the right thing to do you shouldn't fucking do that mm-hmm. but i think like i didn't take it as seriously as some other people. No, no did. unfortunately, all these Me Too par- uh, things, they're all getting grouped together where there's a right. huge difference between like Bill Cosby and Louis C.K. and all this stuff and Harvey Weinstein. And, you know, I did, the thing with Louis is, which is the most interesting thing about it, is that in the comedy community, we already knew about this for years. Yeah. I and no one cared. Right. And we've, it's been on radio shows before and no one cared. You know, then when all this Me Too, Too stuff happening, then everyone's like, oh, God, pay attention to that now. Right. And, and so a lot of us were like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. this is real life. And I don't know. And then all the recent stuff, that's always been Louis, you know, his material. Like when he started ta- talking about the, the sh- Parkland or whatever shooters. And, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I saw a lot of that um, outrage too. And there was a, a few fans that st- – and I didn't honestly listen to anything, any of that, that that he said. I haven't heard what he said, so right. I can't make any personal assessment of that. But a lot of people were like, dude, this has always been his comedy. It's always been his comedy. And that's it's under a microscope. Well, that's, and that's the problem with the one thing that might do in comic comedy and comedy clubs right now is that – everyone's kind of doing the same shit that we've always been doing and now just everyone's so sensitive and it's mm-hmm. like it, it, it's it's like what do we do we censor ourselves or do you guys just stop going to comedy clubs because you can't handle it and go to, right. go somewhere else you little pussies but i feel like a lot of people who are outraged are not even necessarily people who go to comedy clubs they're people who hear about it on social media social and they media pick outrage. up on other people's it's, outrage and then yeah. they and then you know what i mean and then 100 it just it, becomes this huge fucking hurricane it, yep and that's the problem with everything right now <laughs> you know so yeah i mean i have no problems with louis and none of this stuff he does i you know and that's what really sucks is when that you see comics quote unquote comics uh attacking other comics like there was some uh, uh, i don't know all right it was judd apatow he re- he posted something the other day and it was just like like kind of like shitting on louis and and saying you know all this shit about him and it's just like oh you're jumping on that side you know you yeah. little Wow. And, it, and so it's just because comics, one of the rules of comedy, we should never have to censor ourselves. Now, there's right. there's good taste and not good taste. And there's definitely bore, like boundaries that you should just be aware of as a human. 
but there's also points where you know that's the whole point of comedy. Yeah, you know, uncensored. Uh, the, the, when they start censoring comedy, then we're all screwed because then they're censoring freedom of speech. And yeah, I don't know. There was one quote that I heard, and I can't remember one one what comic said it, but I thought that it resonated really well. And it was there are things that I think, and there are things that I think are funny. Right, and I was like, okay, that's an interesting differentiation because just because you may joke about something doesn't mean that you act, that's what you think that's right. your opinion, right? And part of like the way that we as human beings deal with all the fucked upness that's in the world is like we laugh about it. Like sometimes you just have to laugh about stuff because it's like otherwise, like how how can you deal with it? You can't always be like angry and sad and. You know, some of the the funniest jokes are funny because they're true in like a sick, twisted way. Yeah, absolutely. And not to be fair, like what was released was, you know, unauthorized. It was just somebody that stole his act and put it on YouTube. Was it out of context as well? It It, posted out of context? Well, what I'm saying is that like, you know, this might have been an open mic type situation where he's just doing a small little club and he's trying out new jokes. There's been times where I've said stuff on stage I will never say again just because (laughs) I was just like, let's test it out once. Okay, that was bad. Let's not even ever talk about that again. Right, right, right. You know, and and it's really unfair that somebody put it up online because it's like, you know, that was but that maybe would have been okay for this, you know, 30 people in this room, but I really didn't want millions of people to listen to it. I'm right. just testing the waters. If you go to a movie theater and you record a whole movie and you put it online, you know, that person's, uh, you know, should be thrown in jail, thrown in prison. But because right. it's a comic, that, there's no laws about that, you know, yeah. and so that's kind of fucked up. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So um, we have a funny story about how we met. Which yeah. apparently I don't remember. Don't really remember at all. Time. But um, can you can you repeat that? Uh, let, me, let me go back and try to remember. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember we went to your house. Uh, I was dating Taylor Vixen at the time. Who was my uh, roommate? Who was your roommate? Yes. Uh, and we were hanging out. I think with your boyfriend at the time, or he was pro- was he English? Yeah, and tall. He was my yeah. husband. A husband at your yeah. time. Okay, and we all four like hung out. Till like three in the morning, drinking boxed wine or or something, yeah. or wine, and uh, then you went to bed, and we stayed up to like two more hours. Somebody broke a glass at one point, and then I remember I woke up like we crashed in one of your spare rooms or something. And I remember I woke up, woke, I woke <laughs> up, man. I st- started eating kale and, and, and DMT. No, I woke up and uh, I had to leave early. And I remember you were in your bathrobe <laughs> cleaning or something, and I, and I felt so like, "Hey, how's it going?" Like I, 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 uh, I, I don't remember that much from that night. It was a pretty blacky outy nighty. So I, re- so back then I wasn't drinking. I was sober for sure. So uh, the that's fact why you that, do it early. Yeah, that's the fact that I can't remember is really annoying. But I remember <laughs> that Taylor would always try to get me to go to you and Joe's shows, and oh, she's yeah. like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go see." Joe Rogan and Brian Redman, you should come. And I was always like, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my God, I should have gone. Why didn't I go? Uh, yeah. yeah. I missed out. I'm such an idiot. Well, you can still always go if you want to. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come to one of your shows. Um, what was it like dating her? How long did that last? Because she was like, she was a, she was a hilarious roommate because she would she was vanish. really funny. She yeah. was really funny. She was very funny. She would vanish for like, she'd meet some new guy and she'd be, I wouldn't see her for right. weeks. Right. Well, she was the first time I ever dated anyone and knew anyone in the adult industry. So one, it started off really exciting and crazy. Yeah. It was the first time I ever got blue ball. Like uh, I've never had, I didn't think blue ball was actually a real thing, but like the for when we first met, she was like, you know, can you come over and help me with my computer or something? Some some kind of porn thing to say, <laughs> right. and then, <laughs> and then uh, I remembered like she just we just grinded for like an hour. We didn't even have sex, and then and then I was like, all right, well, I'll see you later. And I remember in my car, and my dick was just in pain. I'm like, oh, what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, like I had to pull over and go to the gas station because I thought I broke something or something broke. Did but it was like just go- blue ball. It was, really? and then I had never had that ever again. But. uh you know, it, it, it was. Did you have to like? Did it? Did I don't you have to finish yourself off. I think I had to go home right? immediately, finish myself off, and but uh, but that's how it was really exciting because I, you know, I was I didn't know anything about uh, the adult industry, 
And uh, so I met all her friends, and uh, yeah, she Brett was Rossi pin- commented that she like adores you. Yeah, I love Bryce; she's the best. But uh, yeah, we, like she was Penthouse Pet of the Year that year. Taylor mm-hmm. Taylor was, and I started dating her like literally like the month she became that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the whole year was you know going to AVN and all this exciting stuff I didn't know about. Lots of ups and downs though. Uh, like you know, we broke up all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, not my reasons but whatever we won't go there <laughs> and then you know it was it was fine but it it was very crazy but it was very cool because after that uh then i kind of was in that world so then i started dating a couple of the girls uh that, uh like veronica ritchie and yeah. stuff like that and uh it was fun you know i don't know you know, I'm now I'm kind of out of it, yeah. and so now I'm kind of like, wow, I got out alive, you know, <laughs> because it was definitely, it was definitely, it was weird. It was very weird to be. Luckily, I dated only for the most part only female uh, lesbian porn girls. You know, I was gonna say none of those girls did boy girl, right? And that even that was still hard because then you're talking about photographers that are always been the creepiest people. Not you, but you know, like like oh, oh I, ha- I haven't creepy. <laughs> oh no God, idea. I know. <laughs> but like I had like you know a lot of trust. Uh, you know, issues and tr- a lot of trust just in general. Like, you know, okay, my girlfriend is going to some dude's house in Van Nuys to take some photos. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll trust her, you know, <laughs> and, and things like that. Uh, so it definitely was challenging, especially when you, you know, your old trust issues was like, you know, did you call your ex boyfriend too? Wow, there's like four guys watching you masturbate in Van Nuys, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, was there any, was it ever weird for you to like the fact that her pictures and her video was all over the internet and everybody could see it and all your friends had seen her naked and put dildos up? And, you would like, think so, right? Yeah. You would think that would be one of the biggest things. But it, it's, it's definitely weird because I met her where, you know, where I saw her naked and then she became my girlfriend. Right. Where if, like, I think if I was just dating her, she's like, I'm going to get in porn one day and then it would be a little different. But yeah. since it was like I met her already when she was naked, everyone already, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, 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 it's definitely different. Like if my girlfriend right now just like, I'm going to get in porn, I'd probably lose my shit and jump off a bridge. But, you know, uh, if she had already been doing it and I, it's like, oh, well, it's that's what. That's how I know her. Yeah, you know? <laughs> your girlfriend's super cute. I see her on your Instagram Thank all you. the time. Thank you. Where does she do? Uh, she is a double vaginal, double anal porn star. No, oh, <laughs> no, awesome. no, no. No, uh, she went to college. She's one of those girls. She's really young. She just turned twenty five. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, she graduated college, and now she's like one of those girls that has like a degree that can't find a job. So oh, she's God. just bouncing from stupid job to stupid job. Yeah, it's so. I. I. It drives me crazy for any of you listening, thinking about going to college, unless it's like if you're a doctor or something, do not go, do not spend. She owes so much money Mm -hmm. and she's like making like minimum wage to pay for something that she's not going to use. Like she's not, it's, it, I'm so glad I got out alive without having any college debt or anything. Yeah, the student loan thing is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So are you like so grateful seeing her struggle, like that you found your path and just, like at least you know well what I mean? it's one thing that you know when you're younger like you you kind of freak out like what am i supposed to do you know mm-hmm. where it's what am, I'm, i can't be working this retail job my whole life blah, right. blah, blah. and then it just kind of sorts itself out usually right. you know right. uh, so yeah it's 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 definitely a nice thing being like okay i'm, I'm i got through that now yeah. you know now i could just focus on what i like to do and stuff yeah so. do you think do you see yourself like doing comedy for the rest of your life? Is Probably, yeah. That you want to get into? No, no. The cool thing that I, I, I have my foot in a lot of waters, different waters. Like, you know, I have like a t shirt company, I have a podcast company, I'm a comedian, you know. Mm-hmm. So it, if I was just doing one thing or another, I think. I, I, it would drive me crazy uh, if if I didn't have all these multiple things. Uh, right. Where, you know, so I don't know. It's. Uh, Comedy, though, I think is one of those things that once you get in it, it's really hard to get out. Unless you're, porn. yeah, you, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, I feel like there's a lot of similarities between the porn I've world always, and the comedy. I've always world. thought that was especially strippers, uh, because we're always on the road. We're going mm-hmm. to like these shows, you know, like feature stripping and featuring at a comedy club. Very yeah. similar, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And the and the comedy community seems to be like kind of a close knit community where like you guys all know absolutely. each other, and so is the adult industry. Yeah, absolutely. or it was. You know, that's that's weird because you know I used to go to AVN every year, and it's 
been really weird to watch the the ratio of porn stars and now it's just mostly all cam girls you know yeah. and it's not the same the cam girls aren't the same in in my opinion with the 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 closeness of the community because they're not really working together they they only know each other once in a while from AVN unless they have one or two people over for a cam sesh or yeah s- there's definitely a different dynamic there and it's actually been really interesting to to see that and i have found that i have pro- i don't know i'm going to get shit for this but i have problems with some cam girls not all cam girls there's a lot of wonderful cam girls that i work with who i adore like Molly Stewart Bailey Rain, I love Bailey, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Bailey's awesome. So, but some of these girls that I've worked with, I've found are difficult on set because they, it's a whole different world that they come from. They're used to making money by themselves in the security of their own bedroom. Right. So like they aren't used to working with other people. Right. So they sometimes tend to lack that like professionalism where they, it's a team effort and they're very like focused on, oh, this is about me and about what I want, mm-hmm. which on the other hand, like, Kudos to them to be able to create a career. They're little hustlers. Exactly. To be able to create a career by yourself, on your own, on your own terms. Like, that's fucking amazing. But sometimes when you try to bring them into, like, the porn world Mm -hmm. and have, like, work on set with other people, there can be friction. Yeah. And and not not to mention, probably a lot of them, you know, have, like, social problems, you know. And that's why they've turned to, like, wait, I, you know, I could do this from my house by myself. And not really have to, like, face people face to face. Exactly. And I think also, too, sometimes when you're considering that, you know, a lot of these girls are millennials and fucking millennials, like, have social anxiety problems these days anyways because they're trapped into their phones and they talk to people through text and and through Snapchat, and there's not as much face-to-face interaction as opposed to like how you and I grew up. Like, I think that that compounds the issue as well. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, no, there's definitely been like a kind of little bit of a splintering in terms of like there's like the cam girls, and then there's like the um, porn girls. But uh, also too, like I think people have recognized that camming is such a big industry now, and it's like an integral part of the adult industry. That there's more events being um, held for cam girls, so there's a lot more opportunities for cam girls to come together. And social media mm-hmm. allows them to kind of interact with each other. So like, there's a camaraderie there as well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been like an interesting dynamic yeah. to see happen. Yeah, I love the cam girls too. I think it's. I think that I wish you know. That was bigger, you know, when I was younger or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, because it's it's just fun to watch how much variety and, and pretty much it's and how many people do it nowadays. Yeah. It's it's just pages and pages and yeah. countries and countries. You, I love how you can just pick up. You know, what? I want to see girls from only Africa. You know, I yeah. want to see. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so crazy how many people are you know and throughout the world are doing it nowadays. Yeah. So you, I mean, you're my age. Mm-hmm. So um, you've kind of grown up and watched the internet explode. Uh, I'm assuming that you've consumed porn. Uh, yeah. For some time. Oh yeah. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. So like, what have been like from an outsider's perspective, somebody who doesn't work in the porn industry, mm-hmm. what have what has your been an opinion about how like porn has changed because of the internet well i mean you know porn for me back in the day was just magazines yeah. and and i wish i had a vhs tape uh you know or, or two <laughs> yeah. uh but uh it, you, they, i don't know because it, it's so you're so lucky nowadays uh, mm-hmm. you know to, to have the porn and the computers i couldn't even imagine if if i was 15 you know and that was the thing yeah. uh uh in one part, I, I love the idea how you know porn is blown up and 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 it's so excess. You know, you get VR porn now. You could yeah. get like any kind of kind of thing you want, uh, which is amazing. I, I, I just I just uh, I just you know the big thing is I, I I just miss kind of having the big porn stars, which I don't really feel anymore. I don't, you know, there's a few of them and stuff, but I, it used to be, everyone knew who, you know, certain porn stars were. Like, even your parents, you're like, yeah. how do you know who that is, yeah, you know? Yeah, and yeah. and now it's kind of like you don't even hear about porn stars stars anymore it's more i don't Unless know fuck the president right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but and, you know and i i do love how the, like the porn stars from the old days they're still in it you know and like there's a few of them that are just still going de- strong and I'm, i love that because it's it's kind of like a, a dying breed in my opinion yeah the whole like milf revolution has allowed a lot of people mm-hmm. to have longevity in the industry mm-hmm. which has been really great yeah, yeah what are some of your favorite like old-time porn stars 
old time. I love Tara Patrick. I yeah. love Asa Akira is one of my favorites. Uh, Lexi Bell. Uh, oh, shoot. You know, just, uh, gosh, I can't even think. Jenna Jameson back in the day. Yeah. Um, you know, just all the classics, I, yeah. I guess. Nina Hartley. Yeah, yeah, I know. She's <laughs> right. still working. And she's still working. She certainly is. <laughs> she, I did a podcast with her a long time ago, and I thought what, what was so adorable is she left her scarf there. <laughs> <laughs> I just still have it somewhere. And, I she, just, <laughs> and she like, looks amazing. I mean, she, does she look just amazing. like, she's still got like such a flat stomach. Oh my God. And like, God, she's. Just, I just looked at her the other day and she's still banging. It's I know. Crazy. And I'm like, what the fuck is my excuse, man? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, so you have kids, right? No. Why? Okay. Someone told me that you had kids. <laughs> no. I don't, well, it's, it's like, no, never mind. I don't know. <laughs> Unless, you don't know about <laughs> Unless it. I don't know about it. And you're just trying to trick me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have kids. I've been very lucky not to have kids and you know I don't know I'm just I can't even imagine having a kid here in Los Angeles you know without money you know yeah. that's like I, I know a couple people that are like you know what we're going to have a kid and I'm like you live in a one bedroom apartment in Van Nuys you know yeah. so like well, you're going to walk your kid to school in Van Nuys that's I wouldn't even walk down that street you know yeah. like uh, I don't Do know Do you worry about I mean for me like having a kid I would almost worry more about like the proliferation of the internet and just like and honestly, like the the idea that kids can access so much porn on the internet, like, yeah. Do you think that that's? Do you see that as being an issue? It depends how old they, you know. I mean, I've been. I mean, thinking my first porn magazine. Yeah, but was, think about the stuff of porn that because I looked at porn. Yeah, yeah. And I was young when I first right. saw porn. Right. Right. Obviously, with my parents doing what they did, but like my first exposure to porn was magazines, and mm. I don't know if it was like that when you looked at it, but it was all softcore. Like there wasn't even penetration. Right. In the magazines, but those back bushes then. were pretty scary. So like, <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Like I, I mean, my first couple of years of looking at porn were just the Sears lingerie section and the Sears catalogs, yeah. you know, and stuff. Yeah. Uh, no, that is pretty. I can't even imagine being a parent when it comes to that. I mean, thank God, you know, like the censoring uh, tools that, you know, that are available are pretty legit now. Yeah. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, it takes one, you know, two girls, one cup, and the kids eight, and, you know, (laughs) (laughs) like what's going to happen? What's the mixture that happens to that? You know, they shouldn't be seeing that. No one should see that. But Do you find yourself like a little more jaded when it comes to porn now because you can just like access anything that you want? Yeah, but there's some things that still get me, like especially some of the cam stuff. So I mean, you like the cam girls, like you watch the. Cam oh, girls? I watch it almost every day. Yeah, so okay. uh, yeah, that's. Do they know it's you? Well, yeah, I think I, th- I use a few different names, uh, but uh, I'm I'm open about it. Like, like I know, like the the cam girls that I watch, it's more like not even watching it for the porn aspect anymore. Like Bailey, I love Bailey. It's so cool. I, like I could sit there, put her on the background while I'm editing video, and just listen to her, you know, talk and hang out. Like it's almost like I'm not even watching it to see her tits or anything. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, oh, Bailey's on. I'll see what she's up to. You know, yeah, it's yeah, like kind yeah. of like a podcast almost. But uh, no, I mean, I, some of the stuff though you see still nowadays. Like I, you think you would be jaded, but it's like, oh my god, they. There's, especially with all the squirting going on nowadays. I mean, it's cool, but like... Are you... Okay, do you think that squirting is real or do you think it's uh, beef? I am a huge it's real uh, person just because... Oh, God, do I want to go here? Yeah, you do. Yeah, I do. All right, so... Oh, God. My dick's shaped in a way... It, <laughs> It doesn't go left, doesn't go right. It goes kind of towards your face. Okay, so, so it's a, it's turned up. Okay. It's turned up. So it hits girls' G spots. It hits girls' G spots exactly. So every so gr- basically you're almost great, every time I have great <laughs> yeah, anytime I have sex, the girl usually squirts, and I've never even thought about it. I've just like, wow, that girl is really wet, you know. And then when I started porn, started dating porn girls, they were like, holy shit, no, you, this is why you know you're hitting yeah. the G spot and blah yeah. blah blah. And I've had so many t- squirting sessions <laughs> to the point where I had to actually research waterproof sheets, you know, because I don't want to ruin my warranty of my new bed. And uh, to the anyways, I've had it, you know, a million times. And they're definitely, like, as a good, good example, you know, 
Like, I would have a girl, you know, she would squirt all over the fucking place, and then she would go to the bathroom and pee for, like, 10 minutes, you know? And so it's like, so you just emptied your bladder on me twice? And that makes no sense, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus, like, you know, you could t- taste it, you know, like, you could taste what pee tastes like. And it right. doesn't really taste. Now, is there components of pee in it? Probably. I'm yeah. sure there is. But there's definitely a point where, you know, it's it's like, I don't know. It's, I, I I've just... For sure, do not. There would be a yellow stain on my on my sheets if right. it was pee. Right. I've right. never had a yellow stain on my sheets ever after having sex and making a girl squirt. It's right. never been like, why is there all this vitamin C water on my <laughs> on my bed? <laughs> you know, if it was pee, there would be fucking yellow stains. Have you ever tried to pee on a, wh- wh- a white sheet? You're going to see a yellow stain if yeah. you have yellow pee. All right. Yeah. I don't know. So it's just I don't know. Taste and 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 what do you think? Do you? Well, I think that I think that. It can be. Don't think, get me wrong. I think half the the half the shit you see on the internet, especially in cam girls, is pee, yes. and they're peeing. They're like, oh, I'm squirting, and I'm like, no, yeah. you're not. Yeah, exactly. I think that there's a difference. Like squirting is like it. First of all, if you look, if there's a close up on the vagina and you look mm. really, really close, the squirt does not come, come out from of the, the pee hole, hole, which is like Thank right you. below the clit. Thank right? you. It comes out of the vagina. Right. So you got to, if you look very close, you can see where it comes out, then you'll know. Right. And then some of these girls who do like these overly ridiculous squirting scenes, like mm-hmm. so much comes out that you're just like, there's no fucking yeah. way. Yeah. And me being on set, like a lot of times I will see these girls drink a fuck ton of water. And then, you know, all of a right. sudden they're able to squirt. Like, and right. I'm just like, I remember there was this one, do you know who Marika Hayes is? She's like a Japanese porn star. Oh, yes, of course. Famous <laughs> for squirting. No, I, I probably know who she is. She's famous for squirting. Anyways, right. she I shot her, and I didn't even know she was going to squirt. We were shooting a solo, and it was like a... F- fucking geyser like I, I just I remember like my camera guy like backed up and looked at me he's like what the fuck and I was like I, I had to get a mop oh, a mop to clean that shit up like it was out of control so and I remember and I would go back and like play that over help. and over if you ever again. need help I, I can bring a Swiffer and I'll just be on standby alright do you want to just be a P, you want to be a PA, PA right yes <laughs> just come and P the, assistant exactly <laughs> <laughs> just come and clean up jokes Clean up jokes. Yeah. Clean up pee and then tell jokes. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's one thing because I get a lot of. I've always been a pro. That's not you know, squirts not pee. Mm-hmm. But a hundred percent, there's most of the squirting videos and stuff you see are pee, and yeah. that's just them not squirting. Yeah. What, what I'm talking about, you yeah. know. So. Yeah, and also too, I think you know we're under like the gun in terms of time and stuff like that. So girls can make themselves pretty much pee on demand. Right. Whereas squirting is like you've actually got to hit that spot. Right. So right. Just think in the interest of time. Yeah. Yeah. People will like just be like, I'm just gonna pee, and people are gonna assume it's squirt. And for me, because I'm like paying for the location by the hour, I'm like, yeah, just pee. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's just finish the scene up so we can be fucking done. Oh gosh. So, um, what have been okay? So, you have your own. Do you have your own podcast now, or are you just doing a, a I, I mean, network of podcasts? I have a few. Like, I have my own called What Brian Red Band Do that I haven't done in I haven't done in a while. Okay. Uh, but the big one I'm focusing on right now is called Kill Tony. It's uh, it's a live podcast. Uh, we do it every Monday at the World Famous Comedy Store, and then we go on the road all the time. Like, I'm about to go to. This is how big it's it's become. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're about to go to Ireland and London and oh Manchester God, to do live shows, you know. And so great. So yeah, that's spending mo- most of my time has been, uh, been focused on that. So right. uh, so that's, that's where did great. the name come from? Kill Tony. Uh, it's uh, it, it, the idea. It's based off Kill Bill, uh, Quentin uh. Tarantino, and the whole idea is the podcast is it's kind of like an open mic where we pull a name out of the bucket. A random comic goes on stage, does comedy for one minute in front of us, and then we kind of riff off the person, roast the person, try to help the person. Okay. And the whole idea is kill Tony, the the my co host, the main host, Tony Hinchcliffe, okay. to like kill him, like 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 uh, not to kill him like with a knife, but to like oh you, you made him laugh so hard that right yeah. okay so is so. it it's. It's almost sounds like a workshop in a way. It's kind it? of a workshop, kind of a little bit of everything. And it, we have like a band on the show that they dress up as characters every episode. Like there'll be one week they'll be porn stars and one week they'll be cats, you uh-huh. know. And, and so it's a, it's kind of like, it's, 
it's very unique, but the closest I can probably, it's like imagine American, American Idol or something like that, but with like a improv band and all this other, these other elements mixed into it. And it's really cool because, uh, you know, we have big celebrities on it all the time, you know, uh, and, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun show and, and I'm, we're very lucky because it's, you know, really helping us because now we could go on the road, say like we can go to like Texas, have one of those Kill Tony shows and then a comedy show attached to it. And then we're, you know, it's just, we're selling out everywhere we go. So it's, it's great. So uh, amazing. yeah, yeah. So. so you have like, okay, so it's always you and Tony mm-hmm. and then you guys have different comics on depending on like where you're at. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, so we will, we'll have like a guest comic and then we'll have, you know, our band. If mm-hmm. uh, sometimes we have, we're on the road, we'll bring the band. Other times we won't. And then, uh, then we just have local comics or, you know, people that sign up for it. Right. And so they know what they're getting into. They know right. this is not a regular, you know, one minute. No, no one, we, no one even does one minute sets. That's a hard part on, oh, on really? its own. Cause like one minute trying to go up there, make people laugh and get comfortable in one minute. It's almost impossible. So it's, it's, it's kind of new comics like it because it kind of, helps them and helps them get exposure but also it it trains a muscle that you know cutting out all the fat getting right to the joke which is one of the biggest things in comedy is not to you know you take a 10 minute joke you could probably cut it down to four minutes and it's a hundred times better because you're getting to the point you're cutting all the fat out Mm -hmm. and it kind of helps with that because one minute's impossible to do so but you have a strict one minute rule like they can't go over one minute right right we have this thing where at one minute i'll sound uh, the sound of a kitten so i'm going meow you know and that means get off the stage now and if they go any longer than like say five to ten seconds then we have this really loud bear that just and, and like you can't even do comedy over a bear growling you know that loud so <laughs> they just kind of that kind of is like the gong of the gong show like, right. Get off. Right. right 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 and so um and do, do people often like not finish their jokes does that happen a lot? yeah it happens a lot uh or they try to go longer or they try to fit too much in yeah. and stuff and that's the whole point like after they've done it a few times a lot of people try you know try to go back a few times they figure it out like oh you can't you know you just get right to the one joke you know mm-hmm. don't do all this bullshit around it what do you think is the hardest part of being a comic well, one being on stage, you know, because I mean, for a lot of people that never goes away, you know, like I used to have horrible stage, like I never was in like any of the uh, debate clubs or anything like that. Yeah. I was never on stage. So for me, like sometimes, especially getting off of a Joe Rogan show where there's mm-hmm. a thousand people, sometimes I would get off and I would just sit in the green room holding my stomach from stomach pain and cramps just wow. because of nerves. Wow. And, and, you know, that a lot of comics, that never goes away. To me, I never have that problem anymore where I, I don't even I feel nervous ever anymore. Like it's kind of like whatever that is, is just gone. Mm-hmm. But other comics, even comics that have huge HBO specials, they still get that, that the, the, the nervousness and the scared, you know, yeah. things. And that never goes away. But the biggest thing is probably writing new jokes. You know, you have to constantly be writing. You're writing, 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 writing. And sometimes, you know, you're like, shit, I haven't written anything new in a long time. And mm. so you have to find ways to get your brain back into, like, I'll, I'll like every couple months, I'll be like, you know what? I need to eat some mushrooms, change my ass, you know, <laughs> or, I, need, or I, I put myself in partake in weird situations that, yeah. that, that just so I get new ideas like yeah because you kind of got to go out there and experience right. life you can't just sit in your house and right. then like come up with material like one of my biggest examples which ended up being like a 20 minute joke uh i went down with veronica ritchie uh she we went and swam with the dolphins and i decided to eat about a bunch of mushrooms before that <laughs> and it, you know m- mushrooms at sea world is already crazy yeah you know but mushrooms and then swimming with dolphins and, you know, after I did that, I came up with this whole 15 minute joke about it, you know, 20 minute joke about it. And, and if I hadn't have done that, that joke would never would have exi- existed. So that's yeah. another thing I, a lot of comics always put themselves in weird situations, weird, like what will happen here? You know, yeah. if I did this or do that. And yeah. It was definitely easier when I was dating a porn star because it was just like, what the heck? Oh, I got to write about this, you know? Like, <laughs> well, I'll come be a PA on my set. I'll <laughs> oh, yeah, so yeah, much absolutely. Material, man. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. What advice would you have for up and coming comics? Uh, just do it. Just, uh, you know, do it. Record your sets. Uh, a lot of people don't record their sets. And that's, you know, like just put your iPhone down on the stool when you get on stage and hit the voice memo, you know? Uh, 
uh, because listening to it and and uh, is one of the most important things I think, especially like if you get off stage and you're like, you know, I thought I, I killed it, I did great. A lot of mm-hmm. a lot of comics have this ego mm-hmm. that that they they just had destroyed, and mm-hmm. you're like, then you listen to it, and you're like, oh, maybe I didn't do so good. Like, uh, yeah. I can hear there was no one laughing in my head. There was all these people laughing. Yeah, it was just because I remembered a, a joke, you know. Right, right, right. So yeah, just you know, but but the main thing is just listening to yourself, writing, getting on, but and most importantly, getting on stage because you know. If you want to be a comic, you should be on stage every day, multiple times a day for the first couple of years, and that's something that's that a serious all, commitment. We all have to do it, though. Like I used to do three mics a night for a while, you know, just to at the same place, or would you no, no, around? you'd drive around, and there's websites where you can see how many mics are in Los Angeles, and you try to hit them all, and mm-hmm. you know, and and you have to do that. You have to go through the boot camp of it just so you can get find your voice on stage, which is. The most important thing, because you know, when I first started off, I was really fast, and I no pauses, and I would just be like, I would run jokes into each other, you know, I'd be yeah. like, instead of letting the, you know, to the point where I it felt uncomfortable to watch me because I was not doing the timing right. Yeah, you and gotta so, like let yeah, them breathe. Yeah, yeah. So you know, just that's once you get through that part, which is takes some people forever. Some people never get it. Some people, you know, are faster at it, but. uh yeah. Until you get that, uh, you're not going to go anywhere until you find your voice is what they call it. Right, right. It seems like comedy is one of those, one of the last like models of entertainment that's left where people really need to work their way up to the top, you know, especially like with um, media these days and social media and the internet, like a lot of people can be discovered instantly, you know, like an actress can do one movie and all of a sudden she's huge or a musician can do American Idol and all of a sudden they're huge. But it seems like that doesn't really exist in comedy. Like everybody has to take a really long time to hone their skills Mm -hmm. and, and get up there. I remember seeing like I watched an old set with Louis C.K., when he was new, like, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago, and he was terrible, right. like fucking terrible. Um, is there anyone who, is there any examples of comics who just kind of like come in and hit it right away? Or is it just like a no. slow learning process for everyone? It's a slow learning process for everyone. I mean, there's definitely people that are way faster, mm-hmm. but, uh, and some people that just have a natural kind of funk about them, you know, mm-hmm. they're, you know, uh, but there's never been one person that just got on stage and was like, yeah, blah, 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 and they're immediately funny because yeah. there's so many working elements in it. You know, if there is, I'd be, I'd bet money that that. I don't know. I would have to see it in my with my own eyes because right. uh, there's just too many working parts to be a good comic. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I, even if you have the best personality and stage presence, you don't have the best jokes. You don't have the best delivery of the jokes and. Um, there's definitely people that are faster than the others, but you have to go through it. It seems to be like so many different elements that all have to fit together perfectly. The right. timing, the mm-hmm. stage presence, the yeah. confidence, the joke. Like, yeah. It seems like in so many other um, areas of entertainment, you can have your material manufactured for you. You right. know, like a lot of musicians have people write their stuff. Right. Obviously, people do movies. They didn't write the script. Like comedy seems to be one of the few things left that's like – really organic like everything is to a point yourself to a point once you get to a certain part like a kevin hart then you could just have writers write all your right junk but you got to get you, there yeah you have to get there first, yeah so, so you yeah. have to like prove yourself in right. some way before you get there yeah absolutely i find that really admirable i mean it's something that i could definitely never do um and it, it just seems the whole thing i have nothing but admiration for comics honestly because i just feel like you guys put yourselves out there and you put yourselves in really uncomfortable situations and um i mean from what i hear every comic bomb sets like still to this day mm-hmm. even when you've done oh, even, and just so subject yeah. yourself to that kind of like humiliation on stage to me like i just i'm so like self-conscious i could never do it so i just gotta say like never say never you should try guys. it no, oh, hell no. <laughs> hell. I do want to actually start doing live podcasts, but, you know, I would... Live podcast is a whole different monster. I know. If you think... I'm scared. It seems like even, it should work. I'm not even good at these ones. Yeah, no, but it seems like it should work. <laughs> it usually doesn't. Yeah. I, I used to take some of the live shows I did and tried to do a live version of it, and it was just like, right when you're on stage, you go... Why did I think this was going to be a good idea that this would work? Because you're just talking to somebody else, and the audience is sitting there going, "Why are we just watching these people like talk to each other?" <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's it. 
I don't know. Like live podcast is a whole different monster. Do you find that adding more? Because I my idea was to have like about three or four guests, mm-hmm. like not just me and one other person. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that adding more people to it helps? Or do depends. You think, does some, it get some, like some messy? People, where some people talk over each other. It does. And that's one of the worst things. You have to think of the person listening. Sometimes I do a podcast where sometimes it's uh, what's it, eight mics, eight mics, and Jeez. half the time I'm just sitting there going, "Stop ta- over talking, stop over talking." You have yeah. to like babysit it on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's because you have to listen to the person on the treadmill that's listening to the podcast, and there's like four people talking at the same time. They want to like throw their you know iPhone it's out like the window. People arguing on CNN. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, adding people. You know, I think there is. Something to it, especially if the person, you know, the people that you have aren't the best talkers, I guess. Mm-hmm. It definitely fills in the gaps and kind of makes it easier. Mm-hmm. But I don't necessarily think it's better. You know, it's, I kind of like the one on one because you really get to know that person. Right. Where sometimes, like, if you have two, two or three people, there might be one person that's a little shyer and then one person that over talks everything. And then it's just like, well, I didn't get to know that person at all. You know? Right. Like one person was really right. quiet yeah. because one other, per- yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm being, I'm going to be pretty picky about who I have and I'm going to have guests that I've had on already. So, like, people mm-hmm. that I know, people that I know have good stories, people that I know can, can mm-hmm. speak well right um but i am i am nervous about it but i do want to give it a shot no i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say don't do it i'd just say maybe do it once in a while and see how you like it but but yeah adding more and more people it definitely gets more and more sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't sometimes it's a disaster yeah 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 i guess (laughs) all right brian thank you so much for coming on it was really great to have you can you tell everybody where they can find you online uh death squad.tv is our website where it has all the podcasts i've ever done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of podcasts and it also has our tour dates and my merch uh it has links to my merch shop squad.tv uh, and then I'm on uh, Red Band on R E D B A N on Instagram, Twitter, all the other crap. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter, on Instagram, and uh, also visit my website, hollyrandall.com. Thank you so much. See you next week. <laughs>